welcome to Medical Dialogues Journal Club. I am Dr. Nandita Mohan and today I am going to cover few more studies from the recent November edition that is the 70th volume of the Journal of the Associations of Physicians of India. Temporal lobe seizures are commonly called focal seizures with impaired awareness actually. Temporal lobe epilepsy is known to be the most common cause of partial seizures. However, there is not much known about the correlation of their clinical features of the temporal lobe epilepsy with specific image findings that can be seen on an MRI. So in this single centered observational study that I am talking today, the researchers evaluated the association between the semiology of temporal lobe epilepsy with specific etiological findings as identified on an MRI scan. This was a study in which consecutive patients presenting with clinical features diagnostic of the temporal lobe epilepsy, they underwent a brain MRI. So a total of close to 90 patients were included with the mean age of the study population being around 29 years. Females comprised about 45% of the total sample. The mesial temporal sclerosis was the most common image finding in about 60% of the patients. 4 out of 5 patients had an aura, whereas 70% had automatisms. So the findings of the study highlighted that the presence of aura in temporal lobe epilepsy patients was significantly associated with mesial temporal sclerosis on an MRI scan. So the presence of automatism as well as a history of childhood febrile seizures did not actually have a significant association with any specific etiological finding on an MRI scan. So the presence of dual pathology on MRI was associated with drug refractory epilepsy. Hence the researchers concluded that the presence of aura and drug refractory epilepsy both together actually point towards the presence of mesial temporal sclerosis. Dual pathology on an MRI in temporal lobe epilepsy patients may be a risk factor for drug refractory epilepsy as well. Invasive fungal sinusitis, for example, conditions like mucormycosis or aspergillosis, is manifested particularly in immunocompromised patients and specifically those with diabetes. Mucormycosis is highly invasive and relentlessly progressive, resulting in higher rates of morbidity and mortality than many other infections known. So the present study, it aimed to determine the factors that actually led to the development, the natural history of progression and the therapeutic interventions done for this grave complication in COVID patients specifically. The study included patients who were admitted in the general medicine ward in King Edward Memorial Hospital in Mumbai. And the advised investigations included imaging studies like the CT scan, the MRI. These were all done and they were all noted down. The operative procedures like the functional endoscopic sinus surgery, the abscess drainage, even dental extractions for that matter were performed at the hospital and the details were all noted down. Fungal cultures, sugar monitoring, liver function tests, the renal function tests, complete blood counts, the ECGs, chest x-rays and amphotericin charting were also done. On retrospective analysis of the presenting patients' records, they found that all the patients had received steroids for their COVID treatment and had comorbidities, specifically diabetes mellitus. So the prolonged hospitalization further exposes the patient to various multi-resistant bacteria, making them prone to various secondary infections as well. So this study brings out the fact that physicians actually need to know the associated risk factors that may lead to invasive fungal infections in COVID-19 patients and to regularly examine the patient for any developing signs so appropriate diagnosis and treatment can be initiated as early as possible. It is an unrelenting disease process that actually requires an utmost care. We all know that tuberculosis is a potentially serious infectious disease that mainly affects the lungs. Now, a total of close to 1.6 million people died from TB in the year 2021. Worldwide, tuberculosis is the 13th leading cause of death and the second leading infectious killer after COVID-19 and still continues to complicate health in several ways. Isolated duodenal tuberculosis, however, is a rare entity. It is generally seen in cases with massive involvement of the rest of the intestinal tract. The present study published in this journal reports a case study of a young man with duodenal tuberculosis. 
It talks about a 32-year-old male who presented himself with recurrent vomiting for six months period. Vomiting mostly happened after eating meals, and the vomitus was non-bilious and contained ingested food residue mostly. There was also a history of weight loss. However, there was no history of anorexia, fever, abdominal pain, jaundice, gastrointestinal bleeding, cough, or even hemoptysis for that matter. And also, there was no history of tuberculosis. Contrast: enhanced computed tomography of the abdomen was advised that actually showed the thickened duodenum at D1 and D2 segments junction. The upper gastrointestinal endoscopy was performed, which showed edematous infiltrated mucosa in the duodenum at the junction of D1 and D2 segments. Eight biopsies were taken from the area, and the histopath examination of this duodenal biopsy is revealed chronic inflammatory infiltrate only. The repeat endoscopy was then conducted to obtain a specimen for biopsy, keeping in view findings of the gastric outlet obstruction. Again, in this region, eight biopsies were taken. The histopath study now revealed features of chronic inflammation, necrosis, giant cells, and even granulomas. On Zeal Nielsen stain, the tissue specimen was positive for acid fast bacillus. The patient was initiated on an anti-tubercular therapy, that is, the intensive phase, including rifampicin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol, was given for a period of two months, followed by a continuation phase that included rifampicin and isoniazid for eight months. The symptoms of the patient did improve. So, at the end of the treatment, there was no features of gastric outlet obstruction. And he also had gained weight. The follow-up endoscopy at the end of the treatment was grossly normal, and it revealed a mild deformity at the junction of D1 and D2 without any obstruction. So, on the follow-up histopath, no giant cell granuloma was observed and was negative for acid fast bacillus. Though gastric outlet obstruction is commonly associated with malignancies as well as peptic ulcer disease, the first diagnosis is always other than duodenal tuberculosis in most of the cases. Since the features of duodenal tuberculosis can be non-specific, a higher index of suspicion is necessary for the diagnosis based on clinical, radiological, and endoscopic features, especially in tuberculosis endemic countries of Southeast Asia. That's all for today. Stay tuned to Medical Dialogues for latest updates. Never miss a medical update from Medical Dialogues. Like, subscribe, and press the bell icon.